Hi, I'm Festus Maigenab. Welcome to Business PNG in this edition. The liberalisation of foreign exchange controls, the emphasis on telecommunications. To build the capacity of the organisations that we're working with. Right. Up first, the PNG Chamber of Commerce and Industry. What do we know about the Chamber? Well, one thing for sure, it is a non-stock, non-profit and non-government organisation that stands as the voice for business communities nationwide. It has an ongoing commitment towards the country's development agenda and also gets involved in NEC submissions to change laws. Now, that brings us to our first question, the National Working Group. What do we know about this initiative? Let's find out from the Chamber's President, John Lee. Welcome to the show, John. Yeah, thank you, Anne. Very happy to be here with you. Yeah. Now, John, there's been much uh, discussion regarding the National Working Group. Can you please tell us about the National Working Group? Oh, yes, I'd love to, Anne. It's a very um, uh, interesting subject. Uh, it's, uh, it was established initially under a different name about seven years ago. Then uh, it more or less uh, went into lapsed for a couple of years. But for the last... 18 months or so since Mana Zupe Zirinov has been the Chief Secretary. It's become mm -hmm. very active again. Uh, and what it is is a, a joint body between the government, the national government, and the various business organisations. So the business organisations are represented by the Business Council, the PNG Chamber of Mines and Petroleum, the Manufacturers Council, the PNG Chamber of Commerce and Industry, which I, it's, it's the capacity in which I'm part of it, um, and uh, the Institute of National Affairs right. are all represented. And on the, on the government side, we have representatives from Treasury, IRC, Customs, um, uh, various other bodies uh, uh, from time to time, and in particular the Department of uh, Commerce and Industry or Trade and Industry, mm -hmm. who, um, who provides a secretariat. So there's a, uh, they have a couple of staff on, on uh, strength to uh, provide secretari secretariat support for it. And, and what it does is um, it enables the business community to put issues to the government. So about 18 months ago we had a lot of consultation amongst the various um, um, bodies, including the uh, Chambers of Commerce throughout the country, right. who contributed uh, thoughts as to what should be the priorities for uh, getting business moving, you know, removing impediments to business and investment and just generally improving the business investment climate uh, in Papua New Guinea. And so a more or less a program was worked out then involving things like um, improvements on uh, you know, telecommunications, infrastructure, uh, um, law and order. Um, uh, migration and work permit issues, right. um, uh, improvements, uh, land access, you know, reform of the land laws to provide more, uh, mm -hmm. more formal title available for development and, and, and in particular also uh, separately uh, administration of the lands department because we'd seen significant problems there. Um, these and, and, and many other issues have, have been um, uh, under the sort of watch of the National Working Group to um, work together with government to come up with solutions to some of these issues. And, 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 and if you look at um, the history of it, there's been quite a number of uh, major achievements. There was a reform of the work permits uh, some years ago. There was probably more work still required, but there was a major improvement a few years ago, which was directly the, the liberalisation of foreign exchange controls, the emphasis on telecommunications. We've also seen a reform of telecommunications laws a few years ago, which has made a huge impact. Um, of course, they're, they're sort of old issues now. We're moving, mm -hmm. We've moved on to uh, the new s set of issues, which I outlined before, and, and, and other things that come up from time to time. Mm. So you're obviously a good representation from all sectors of uh, the community, by the sounds of it, sectors of business, I should say. Well, it is. You've got the big, the, the major sectoral uh, bodies, such as manufacturers and chamber of mines, are obviously very important. And then you've got the PNG Chamber, which represents all of the chambers of commerce throughout the country. And so that provides a very, and I should say, more recently, the Indigenous Business Council, who we've welcomed on board mm. through the participation of Segura Bogan or his uh, representative. Mm -hmm. um, that's a relatively recent development. Um, so yes, there is a very broad uh, representation for business. And I do take the opportunity to, um, uh, through my representation, uh, the Chambers of Commerce to be active in, you know, generating um, matters that they'd like us to focus on. Um, and they have done so. I mean, one of the issues uh, we're concerned about was the uh, with the growth of the LNG, with the LNG project, the mm -hmm. impact on uh, regional areas such as through the. Um, um, you know, the uh, uh, fact that a lot of the trained people were being, you know, sucked up by the LNG project and right. that was of concern in particular, I think, to um, uh, East New Britain, for example. I mean, it could well have been others. So we get, we get issues from different chambers from time to time that they want to, that are particularly important for them. But when you put it all together, you, you get a very good uh, sense of what the, what's going on in the regions. Mm. Um, and this needs to be brought to the attention of the government. And we certainly do that on a regular basis. The National Working Group meets generally on the th last Thursday of every month. Um, uh, and uh, so that group that I described before gets together 
in the Chief Secretary's conference room and uh, we have a sort of ongoing agenda so if uh, something seems to be getting left off we, we get it back on again so we might try and get some attention and, and it's described as the working group quite deliberately because it's not just about sitting around having a discussion, it's not a talk fest, right. I mean we try and keep it action oriented so it's really all about moving forward specific proposals for you know, reform or, or uh, you know, some measure to actually address it. Could, it could feed through to a, an NEC submission mm -hmm. or some change to the law or, uh, um, you know, or some, uh, you know, uh, attention being given to a particular government department. I, I mean, I was talking a few years ago, we had the, national, we had the uh, Secretary for Labor in and we asked the Secretary, um, you know, how long does it take to process a work permit? And the answer was, it takes two weeks. Well, no, hang on. So we can do. Sorry, we can do them in two weeks. You know. So, well, no, no. I didn't say how long is it, can you do it. How long does it actually take you? <laughs> realistically, and, and they weren't able to give an answer. So the chief secretary at the time, Joshua Cullinan, said, "Well, can you come back with some statistics?" It turns out it was taking more like four or five months. You know, which was the which was the issue. So once that helped people realise that there was actually a problem, and then you know, major work was done to re reform the law, and, uh, and and it's much better now than it used to be. Although that said, there are still issues with um, you know restricted entry visas, which we've been talking to them about for some time. Now, and that hasn't quite happened yet, so I'm not trying to say this is a, all ter terrific. I mean, there are still issues that need to be addressed, and these keep coming up again. And, and the National Working Group then asks government for um, a sort of an update and try to, to understand what, why it's being delayed. And we encourage them to, to um, you know, move forward with these things. And the Chief Secretary is very good at sort of following up with the relevant uh, agencies to um, try and progress the issues, uh, mm -hmm. knowing that it's an important issue for business. Yeah. More insights into the National Working Group when we come back. Now, taking a look at the legal side of things when it comes to wanting to set up shop here in Papua New Guinea, apart from being the chamber president, John Lee is also a lawyer by profession. So what's his perception on the issue and how does this tie down with the National Working Group? It sounds like you've had some good successes then with the National Working Group, John, and um, I understand you yourself are a lawyer. Yeah, that's right. Um, and I wonder, what would be the sort of difficulties investors face uh, from a legal perspective when they're trying to do business here in PNG? Well, speaking again as the President of the, of the Chamber, but it is an interesting point you make because um, one of the areas of focus for the National Working Group right now is to um, uh, um, reform the foreign investment laws uh, which are um, enacted under the Investment Promotion Act. Now, I've been advising people at a, per on a personal level on in investment promotion applications for more than 20 years, and um, I've never seen one that's ultimately knocked back, although some are. But the situation at the moment is that it can delay a business getting started for several months, if not, you know, if not a year or more. Mm -hmm. um, so it really does require some reform. Uh, personally, I think it requires a, a rethink of the legislative framework, the, mm -hmm. the, the law. But it also it, it, um, it will involve in part a change to the administration of the approval. So just so so you know, um, in order to carry on business as a foreign enterprise here, you have to be certified under the Foreign Investment uh, sorry under the Investment Promotion Act, mm -hmm. and you'll get approval to carry on business in a particular activity or you know maybe more than one activity. Mm -hmm. um, and unless you have approval in a particular those activities, then you can't do any business here at all. So mm -hmm. that actually acts. Um, I mean, that would be okay if you could get your approval quickly, but it takes a long time. And even several months is too slow, in my opinion. So, um, and, you, and you can't get work, until you get the foreign investment approval through the Investment Promotion Authority, you can't um, have your entity uh, uh, take up work permits. So you can't bring in the skilled foreign labour that you may need to, in order to you know, commence your business and what have you. So it's a significant impediment and a significant delay. So we've got that on the agenda for the National Working Group to address. and 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 and. and and I mean, um, this is no criticism of the IPA. I and mean, the IPA are very happy to be engaged to in that process. And the IFC is providing some technical support mm -hmm. to the um, to the IPA to review the laws. Um, you know, what we'd be, what I personally would like to see is a much more streamlined approach, where you know some initial checks are done on the bona fides of the investor, uh, and as long as that's okay, um, you know, the, the the approval can be granted. 
they don't really need to be looking at the business plans and all that sort of thing. It just no. seems to be not really relevant for what the IPA, what the IPA's role is now. If you go back 20 years ago when the state or it was necessary to have local ownership of these businesses, well then they had a, a, a reason to be looking at the business plans and the cash flows and all that. But that's no longer the case because um, you are allowed in, in most activities to be um, um, have 100% foreign ownership these days, and that's been the position for a long time. I mean, there's still a, there is a reserved activities or cottage industry, and that's that's fine, and that list gets reviewed from time to time, and that's that's fine. But I'm really only talking about the ones which foreigners are allowed to come in. Um, there's really no point the IPA um, spending all this time to uh, to um, you know review all the business plans and everything. I mean, I, I think it's a bit of a wasted activity and causes a, a very sometimes very long delay before um, businesses can come in and invest and take up business opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that, that's, that's an issue at the moment, that, that's, um, that needs to be addressed and, 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 the, and the National Working Group is, uh, is looking at it uh, and, and looking to um, encourage some change to the law in that, in that particular area, as well as all the other things that they're looking at too, such as infrastructure, you know, ports, <coughs> um, the power, energy is obviously you know, big issues at the moment as well. So the National Working Group at the moment supports uh, the initiative of the government to develop the infrastructure in the country. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, it's been pushing, the various business organisations have been really pushing the government or encouraging the government to do that. And it's not that the government doesn't want to do it. I think it's, it's more a matter of how to do it and, and how quickly they can do it. And, and the implementation um, is, uh, you know, obviously an important issue. And uh, we heard from the Prime Minister at the recent uh, uh, business forum mm -hmm. um, that... Uh, uh, that he was very keen to make sure these things get done, and he's uh, he's uh, he was saying he's micromanaging a little bit, and that's that's fine. I mean, it's we we we're confident that he's um, understands the need, and um, and is very very grateful that he's he's pushing it the way he is. So we are, I think, we are likely to see you know quite a bit of infrastructure development over the next year or two, and it's very timely. And incidentally, I would say also the PNG Chamber is quite supportive of the deficit that the government's running in the budget at the moment because uh, that will enable you know infrastructure to be developed. And um, you know we wouldn't always support deficits, but I think with the present situation, um, with the need, and also the very uh, real and uh, you know actual um, development of the LNG project, it gives the government the opportunity to uh, to do that. And also the government, the national budget balance sheet in a sense is quite strong at the moment. There's plenty of foreign reserves. There's not a lot of foreign debt, so you know it would make sense for the government to borrow as well to. Um, to um, develop that infrastructure. So again, we're um, not sure what exact shape the um, overseas or local borrowing will take. And I know there's a controversy between the central bank and treasury on that, but that's okay. Um, but uh, um, whatever form it takes, I think the business community is quite supportive of a, of, a, of a modest and sensible level of borrowing to enable infrastructure to be investment infrastructure at this time in the country's uh, development to uh, take it to another level. So. Uh, it's really quite an exciting time to be in Papua New Guinea, I think. Yeah. Stay tuned, our interview continues when we come back. You're watching Business PNG and we're talking with the President of the PNG Chamber of Commerce and Industry, John Lee, more into the legal aspect of doing business here. What legal aspects does the government fail to identify when it comes to the ease of setting up a business? I think that one that we spoke about before is probably the, 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 the main issue at the moment. It's, it's that delay in getting the Investment Promotion Authority approval because of the, because of the process they have to go through under right. the current legislation. So I'd like to see that. Yeah, when you're talking about specific legal things, I mean, there are other impediments. I mean, obviously, law and order, we would say, requires more attention, although we're seeing in recent times the recent graduation as cadets and what have you, that's really promising. I mean, we hadn't seen any cadets at all for a long time coming through. That's a, bit of, that's a wonderful development. We did, I think we should see more of that, you know, um, but that, that, that's sort of, heading, sort of heading in the right direction. But in terms of legal impediments, I mean, um, I mean, PNG has a, a very robust system of rule of law. I mean, we've got a very good independent judiciary. Um, you know, we have little hiccups from time to time, but, but by and large, the, the, the judiciary is independent of government. I mean, we saw them stand up very robustly, you know, in the previous cha cha challenges that were going on, what have you. We've sort of lived through all that and survived it. And um, the, um, uh, 
there's a court there's a court system which functions you know reasonably well I mean I think they could do with some capacity building they're not so much in capacity building in terms of size and just to get rid of backlogs and things but even there they are um, they are improving the situation there's a commercial stream being set up and a number of steps they're taking but I think there's a fair way to go in that regard but but having said that it's a it's a, it's a functioning court system I mean you can't say this about a lot of um, you know emerging countries and PNG has a very good track record of an independent judiciary you know rule of law being applied um, you know, statutes are, are sort of published, you know, you can tell what the law is. You know, some countries you've got to, it's hard to work out what the rules are. Whereas in PNG, you know, we have a fairly transparent system of law, um, which is very, very positive for, um, for um, development. Um, I think one area that does need attention, though, is land but at two levels. One is the, um, um, the need for accessibility to, to formal titles. And we've got a bit of a problem at the moment with the sort of... Uh, uh, sort of moratorium on the on the uh, the Savills, you know, the, the, the and, and and that's understandable. But that we do need to get past that so people can so the legitimate investor can get mm. proper title to um, agricultural land if that's what they need, you know, subject to the appropriate social mapping and all the rest of it to make sure it's done properly. But that's you know that assuming that it's done properly, we need that possibility to be there so that uh, the legitimate foreign investors in in, in agriculture, because it's going to be an important issue for PNG, of course, you know, with the. Um, uh, resource development, I mean agriculture, we need to really make sure agriculture is okay because of the possible strengthening of the currency will mean the incomes for those people will be reduced in Kenya terms. So it's a very important issue. Um, and the other side of, the other part of the land equation is the uh, need for some significant help for the lands department, although that's starting to happen. This is another area that the, that the uh, National Working Group had the Registrar for Lands in about a year ago and he gave a very honest and candid uh, assessment of the problems that the lands department has mm -hmm. in administering the titles. You know, they have um, you know, duplicate titles, multiple titles, <laughs> you know, titles you know, for each of the wrong people, all sorts of problems. And, they're, and they're facing, they're fa the, the, the very good thing about that is that they're facing up to the fact that they have serious problems um, and they're getting some help to um, put it online and these kinds of things. So that's a very positive development. Um, in fact, they'll be coming back to the National Working Group in the next month or two um, either at the next meeting or the meeting after to report on their progress and we'll be wanting to see that there has been significant uh, progress in dealing with those issues because it is a significant impediment to business. I, I see it quite often my day time, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, problems with people having, you know, title issues with the lands department. So that, that, that is an, an impediment. It's not so much a legal issue in, in a sense. It's not, not a, I don't think it's going to require a legislation. It'll, it, it's more about administration of the lands department. It's, but I think there is something happening there which will be... Uh, will be good, but it's, we haven't really seen the outcome yet. So, John, thank you so much for your time today. An absolute pleasure. Yeah, no, good to meet you, Anya, and uh, thank you for the, for the interesting uh, questions that you raised. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. John Lay, the President of the PNG Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Up next, insights into the Australian business volunteers. Welcome back. In this segment, we speak to Sarah O'Connor, Chief Executive Officer of Australian Business Volunteers, in an attempt to find out the kind of service they provide and their participation in Papua New Guinea. I have with me Sarah O'Connor, the Chief Executive Officer of Australia Business Volunteers. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Sarah, just tell us a little bit about uh, Australian Business Volunteers, or ABV as it's known. Australian Business Volunteers is an international development um, organisation. We're um, a not-for-profit, um, Australian not-for-profit organisation that sends um, volunteers um, across Australia, uh, Asia and the Pacific. Um, our focus is um, on business volunteers, business experts. So they're generally uh, mid-career or early retirement. Um, and we work with organisations, small to medium enterprises, um, in uh, PNG, for example, to transfer skills um, and mentor and build the capacity of the organisations. And how long has the ABV been in PNG? Um, we've been here for about 30 years, actually. We started um, in 1981 um, as an initiative between the um, government and business um, who recognised that there were um, a core group of retired experts. Um, and because um, we've had a long, Australia's had a long relationship with um, Papua New Guinea over the years, um, it's one of the first countries that we started to work in. Excellent. And 
Do you have a selection criteria who, who generally wants to come to P&G and, and offer skills? Uh, we, um, uh, I guess one of our core values is altruism. So we're looking um, for volunteers who have um, the business skills that we focus on, such as um, finance, human resources, marketing, communications. Um, and and that's, a, that's the core um, minimum that we, we need from them. But on top of that, because, because our um, area, because we're a not-for-profit and because altruism is our, uh, our key um, value, uh, the volunteers have to have um, uh, skills of mentoring and capacity building um, and, and they're there to, um, to work with the organisations rather than, uh, uh, they're there for the, for the sake of the organisations. They obviously get a lot out of it themselves but um, the core reason is for to, to build the capacity of the organisations that we're working with. Right. And what type of organisations do you uh, provide these services to? Uh, we, as our name suggests in terms of businesses, um, we do um, increasingly work with small and medium organisations, um, but it's also building the capacity um, of, of an organisation across, organ across the span of um, you know, finance, HR, um, IT. And we're also finding that there are a lot of government organisations, ministries, um, and other not-for-profits that also need those skills, that it's not just a, they're business skills, but they're not just for businesses to be able to run an efficient organisation. So it is a range of organisations. Um, we're increasingly working um, with larger organisations who may need that um, capacity building through a range of areas so that we may send a volunteer for two months at a time. But, they, but we're developing partnerships so that they can go back and, and revisit the skills or to diversify um, into other areas of the organisation. And how long is, is generally their tenure when, when, you do, when, they, um, they, when they are contracted to local businesses? It, generally it's um, two months, two to three months. Mm -hmm. um, but as I, um, we're increasingly looking to um, have those repeat assignments so that for, um, we'll work with um, our colleagues um, in the organisation and then return maybe three to six months later to try and continue that long-term capacity. Um, and we often find that volunteers, because it is something that they're very passionate about, um, they often continue that mentoring role when they return to Australia. Yeah. And our volunteers who come to Papua New Guinea um, often come and work with a number of different organisations, so they become increasingly aware of, um, of the political and the cultural environment of um, Papua New Guinea and, and how to work more effectively here as well. I was well. going to ask, as part of your selection criteria, do they need to have some knowledge or experience in PNG? Uh, in PNG or in the region, um, increasingly, we uh, the, and also ha um, being able to have that um, adaptiveness to work in different environments. Obviously, working as an executive um, in a big bank in Sydney um, is very different to working um, in Papua New Guinea or around the Pacific. So we're really looking at how they can use their expertise that they've had built up over their professional lives, but transferring that into a um, uh, in a, to a completely different work environment. And I guess that's where they're very good at doing that because they have often been consultants or um, uh, because they're at the, at the peak of their career back in Australia, they have that quick ability to adapt and to um, judge the situation that they're working in. Mm. So where do you source your main funding? And um, uh, with your types of volunteers, is it every sector? That, that you're available to? Uh, in ter when you say sectors, do you mean... Um, uh, sectors of the industry here? Yeah, um, yes it is, yes it is. Um, and we do have a, a, um, a relationship with the Australian Government to deliver, um, to, for our volunteers to be funded under that, under the Australian Volunteers for International Development right. um, uh, program, and we do um, partner with Oz Training to deliver that as well. But increasingly, we're working directly with organisations and through other partners as well, other international donors um, and other um, companies um, that may not be able to afford um, the assistance of a high paid consultant, for example, but um, could afford to pay um, and fund um, uh, the support that through a volunteer who, you know, their, their flights and their accommodation, for example, to be here for a short period of time. Okay. So how many volunteers would you have in the country at the moment? Uh, in the country at the moment, I think we've probably got a handful, um, but they go out over, um, in and out over the course of the year. And what has been the response, uh, or what's the response been like from the PNG industry? Oh, fantastic. Um, you know, we're, we're working um, 
with um, organisations like the UN Women, um, we've um, and, and then it's a couple of other local NGOs, um, and also um, we're looking to place a volunteer in um, one of the ministries as well. So um, there, there is the strong support there, um, and it's just um, having being able to um, really scope and identify what the work is that the organisations need, um, tightly define it um, so that the volunteer can come in and really focus on, on a key outcome um, in, a, in a short period of time. Okay. What, can you identify some of the challenges of a volunteer working here? I mean, there must be some immigration issues and, and things like that. Uh, immigration isn't, um, isn't so much of a, a problem because we are able to manage the visas um, as a volunteer. They, they come under different arrangements. Um, but I think the, um, the challenges are probably more um, the cultural challenges. Um, uh, even though we're really quite close um, in, in terms of distance, um, coming from, for example, um, we're based in Canberra, um, coming from the southern states to PNG is a very different country, um, climate-wise um, and culturally-wise as well. Um, so there are challenges in, in adapting to that, um, but with those challenges are associated with the rewards that, that you experience as well, um, the relationships that are built over time as well. And we often find that once our volunteers have been here once, they're actually looking to do another assignment time and time again or to come back and work with the same organisation. So you have many repeat volunteers? Oh, definitely. Um, and I think that's the beauty with our organisation because they're registered and they're actually, uh, a, a lot of them are our members as well, so they actually feel part of, of the organisation. Um, and as a not-for-profit, that's something that we engender um, in, in building our own organisation as well. Very passionate about what they're doing, yes. Thank you for that good work, Sarah, and thank you for being on the show. That's not a problem, thank you. Sarah O'Connor, CEO of Australian Business Volunteers. And that's all we have lined up for this edition. To access our programs online, log on to www.mtv.com.pg and go to our Business PNG page. Comments and suggestions? Send them through to the email address now shown on your screen. Also a reminder that we do have a Facebook page for social interaction. Drop us a line or two. Until next Tuesday, I'm Festus Mike and up. Bye for now.